Climactic changes can occur so slowly that it is tough to look backwards and find the inflection point. There was a blessed time when sport bikes ruled the streets. The ethos of win on Sunday, sell on Monday fueled rapid technological progress, and more importantly, contingency money helped fuel road racing. Every Japanese factory had at least a 600 and an open class bike. A few had 400cc four cylinders, and perhaps the most perfect sporting displacement, the 750cc. Eventually, the macro trends of demographics, economics, regulations, both government and racing, and consumer taste began to evaporate this sea of choices. Ten years ago, no one had a bingo card that said the Europeans were going to dominate MotoGP and that there wouldn't be a USA national 600cc racing class, but here we are. Some factories cast around throwing design darts at the demographic board, hoping to find a product that hits the sweet spot of cost, performance, and lifestyle. And the National Racing Series has turned to spectacle-based performance balance racing in hopes of breaking through the cluttered entertainment space. But Kawasaki simply said chuck it, and engineered, homologated, and manufactured a complete line of sport bikes. You want a 400cc sport bike? You want that as a twin or a four. A race winning, capable 1000? No problem. A price point 650 twin? Check. I like to think there was an H2 design meeting where a Japanese engineer cranked to the gills on vending machine cold coffee, wiped the sweat soaked bangs from his forehead with his white short sleeved arm, and shouted, Bra, hear me out. Let's supercharge it. When you stack up the offerings on a Kawasaki showroom, it dwarfs the sport bike lineup of any other manufacturer in the world. They're even putting up millions in race contingency money. Let's party like it's 1999 and Kawasaki is spinning up on the drum riser. So while the other factories have thrown in the towel on street legal fast middleweights, Kawasaki shaved a hair off the cams, moved a little power lower in the RPMs, and slid their ZX6 through Euro 5 emissions to be the last street legal middleweight four still racing. One can't help but wonder if Kawasaki Heavy Industries' diversified manufacturing base and revenue streams are now giving them an advantage over their pure motorsports Nipponese brethren. KHI makes most of their revenue from heavy industry work building container ship engines. My favorite specs out at 93.5 RPM with 100,000 horsepower. They also make airline fuselages, railroad rolling stock and the like. And although consumer product contribute to the bottom line, there's something to be said for having the performance brand name established firmly in the minds of purchasing department individuals when you are bidding on the subway car contract for New York City, which KHI won. With that preamble, I awoke at 3 a.m. to a text message letting me know that inclement weather was going to be moving into Washington State and threatening to drown the racetrack on our scheduled riding day. Kawasaki, showing their YOLO adaptability, decided to move the riding up to the arrival day, so the new schedule was arrive, transfer from the airport directly to the racetrack, and ride from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. in the evening. Now the ridge is nestled into this beautiful Pacific Northwest pine forest. Those dark green trees, even on sunny days, have this haunting beauty. And if the Japanese phenomena of a suicide forest makes it to the U.S., it'll undoubtedly be located in the PNW pines. For the time being, the ridge does not have any pairs of shoes with strings leading off to the woods, but it does have about six blind crests and 16 numbered turns and a fair amount of elevation, including the dramatically descending but awkwardly slow waterfall. There's a chicane to ruin the fifth gear fun on the front straight. Although the waterfall is crazy slow, the fact that it is downhill allowed me to get away with the bottom of second gear with gravity doing the heavy lifting of acceleration into the right hander after the clumsy left at the top of the hill. The most invigorating crest is turn three, full on the gas, fourth gear, on the right knee, over the blind crest, and the line is pointing you straight off the track. I mean, I know that all lines ultimately point off the track, but this one really looks like you are headed right off into the pines. 
In the olden days, Kawasaki had two versions of the ZX-6. One was 599 cc's for the 600 cc homologation. The other was 636 for street, track day, and middleweight superbike enthusiasts. And I got to ride them back to back. You, when you did that, you noticed that the 600 had a lighter crank and therefore slightly more nimble handling. But without that back-to-back -back comparison, the 636 feels intuitive and effortless in carving a line with just the slightest drag on the front brake lever. So when the Suicide Forest is beckoning over the turn three crest, I could simply take the bike to 50 degrees and arc a long line away from the trees and up the hill into turn six. Given my sleep-deprived state, I was relieved to find the bike was natural to ride for my 170-pound 510 meat chassis. The narrow seat, the clip on to rear set triangle, even the lever positions felt right from the first turn. The steering is the perfect blend of stability and agility. And despite Pirelli supplying SC1 tires, that's their full tilt medium soft sprint race lick for the event, the forks and the shock didn't collapse from the additional grip afforded by the European rubber. The ridge only has a single medium braking zone into the chicane where you go from 5th to 2nd and a couple of light ones like 4th to 2nd, but with the bike's light weight and the middle weight speeds, the dual 310mm Nissan clamped front brakes were well in excess of the requirements. The bike is available as a Euro required ABS model, as well as a $1,000 savings non ABS model. My steed was an ABS model, and the chicane braking zone fed some pulsing back through the brake lever. It wasn't that the front was locking up and releasing, it was that the ABS pump was pulsing the lever, and my dinosaur brain interprets it as warp rotors, but aside from that observation, even the stock brake pads felt decent and provided a nice soft bite when I needed to tighten a line from overcooking an entrance while still getting the bike stopped for the straight up and down hard decelerations. The ZX-6R is a little old school in a couple aspects, and that has its pros and cons. The pros are that it has a cable connected to the throttle butterflies, which the rider can turn, and that means that there isn't a central committee meeting that has determined how much air the engine can inhale in various gears and grip inputs. Virtually every ride-by-wire bike on the market has restrictions on throttle butterfly opening, which limits noise and emissions, but also power. In an unrestricted race configuration, ride-by-wire allows for wondrous features like tunable torque delivery, auto blip downshifts, and more sophisticated traction and wheelie control. But for the most part, RBW simply injects an authoritarian layer to the rider experience from either race sanctioning bodies for performance balancing, or worse, administrative state bureaucrats. Freed from the constraints of black box butterflies, the ZX-6R rider can be confident that when one opens the grip to the stop, the butterflies follow. And with two power modes and three traction control modes, there is still a degree of rider adjustability and performance, but honestly, if you just keep good tires on it and ride it in full power traction control one, which is the least interference all the time, you are good to go. The ZX-6R has one generation older TC in that it lacks the inertia monitoring unit, the IMU data, in its ECU network, but it is using differential wheel speed sensors and crank speed delta. At its core competency, the traction is provided by a 180 rear tire, a great chassis, and the moderate power generated by its 636 engine. In other words, if you enter the turn, get direction, put the throttle on the stop. Only in rare circumstances is that rider strategy ever going to cause the TC to activate. The only drawback to the cable-equipped throttles is the lack of auto blip for downshifts. I was appalled at how fast I have become entitled to the luxury of full lean third gear drama free downshifts. At least the old school mechanical slipper clutch on the ZX6R was well calibrated, so when I resentfully stomped down three gears and dropped the clutch lever, it rewarded me with a perfectly stepped out entrance. The bike does have an ignition interrupt upshift allowing for full throttle upshifting, and the sensor in the ship lefter is unidirectional, which means it will need to get swapped out for an aftermarket one if the rider wants to go from street to GP shifting pattern. The transmission otherwise was smooth and precise with no discernible grittiness in the shifter and no extra neutrals. 
Culturally, the PNW has a reputation for nonconformity, so it is no surprise that their premier racetrack is counterclockwise, yielding a predominance of left-hand turns. And I couldn't quite figure out why, in that context, I was initially uncomfortable in the few rights, and I realized there's a gap between the peg and the rear set bracket that was trapping my boot. Riding a bike around a racetrack is one thing, but a successful race platform has to also be maintained and serviced. And I didn't have a chance to do a valve lash check at the press launch, so I texted Stefano Mesa's, who's now Kayla Yakov's, 2023 ZX6 crew chief to see what he thought of the race winning bike he was maintaining. It's super easy to work on and service with excellent parts availability, texted back Michael Godin of KWS Motorsports. And I asked him if you're tracking the bike but you're not trying to win nationals, he says a good ECU tune and exhaust and you are ready to go. The 2024 ZX6R has minor improvements from the 2023 and one bit of a compromise. Euro 5 regulations and the American Clean Air Act, not to mention CARB, all force manufacturers to make compromises to be allowed to sell performance motorcycles. In the case of the ZX6R, it was that KHI needed to reduce the tailpipe hydrocarbon emissions. Four-stroke performance engines are tuned for resonant frequencies in the intake and the exhaust track. And when a cam opens a valve, a little reverse shockwave travels at the speed of sound back up the intake or down the exhaust. When that wave hits a change in the track, e.g. the end of the velocity stack or a pipe dimensional change, a reverse wave goes back towards the valve. If you get it all just right, the wave arrives just as the valve is closing and that energy wave either forces a little extra fuel air charge into the combustion chamber on the intake side or on the exhaust side, it pushes the fuel air charge chasing the burned exhaust gas out the exhaust valve and back into the combustion chamber. There is intake charge chasing the burned exhaust gases out the pipe because to get a lot of power, you want something called overlap in your cam timing. And that means there's a period of time when the intake valves and the exhaust valves are all open at the same time. And while this is necessary to get decent power, it does mean you end up with a little bit of raw fuel going into the exhaust pipe, which then needs to get burned up in the catalytic converter or it gets sniffed by the EPA. And while RPM and throttle opening are variable, the speed of sound is pretty much a fixed constant. So all of this changes across the RPM range of an engine. Now, the 2023 ZX6 had a little too much overlap for emissions. So the cams were revised slightly down where they lowered the duration and therefore less overlap. And they also reduced the lift slightly. Now, it's not all bad news, because that whole resonance thing means that the engine designers are always trying to spread power out across the RPM range. Less lift and less duration and longer airbox velocity stacks mean that the bike makes more power lower in the RPM while giving up a little at high RPM. And that makes the bike slightly better for street riders while making it slightly worse for racers. That said, Chuck Graves know how to get crazy horsepower out of this engine, so you can take this engine from 115 horsepower all the way up to 135 horsepower, as long as your credit rating will allow you to do it. The 2024 has got new styling with new LED headlights, and those were welcome at the ridge because the sun was setting while we were still on the track. Kawasaki also has a phone interface that allows the OBD2 data stream to be recorded in your phone over Bluetooth. I didn't actually get much chance to play with it, but apparently it will record the details of your ride. Unfortunately, the ZX6R doesn't get a lap feature, so recording data at a racetrack will only yield one file, and I wasn't able to find out if the data files were accessible in a clear format such that it could be easily parsed in a spreadsheet. The ZX6R has a cassette transmission, and officially that is to allow ratio tuning, but in my experience of the world, it makes it a lot easier to change out the third, fourth gear cluster and the shift drum when those parts inevitably wear out. And you can do it all with the engine in the frame. The bike comes equipped with very competent and serviceable suspension with a 41 millimeter SFF BP fork and a Showa gas charge shock. Although the bike comes with Pirelli Diablo Rosso 4 tires, on the track we were rocking the SC1 slicks, which have a ton of grip. Sometimes a lot of grip actually makes bikes handle worse if 
if it overworks the suspension or overtaxes the springs, but this suspension was perfectly serviceable for street riders and honestly for most track riders. If you buy a ZX6R, sign up for a track day because this environment, the racetrack, is where you're going to be able to really experience the bike to its fullest potential.